before lunch, uh, you, I will pick up, as you read already, uh, the topic of time. So we won't speak briefly about also about the so-called objective astronomical time to a set in contrast to the subjective time. And uh, so you can, can get, and I invite you to get easily, rapidly, into the mood of subjective time, so you, you, won't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't feel the hurry that I have to press on you, because there's a lot of slides and a lot of uh, information. You just pick up what is uh, positive for you. Um, um, I think, and that is why I picked up this uh, thing, because it's always a challenge for me to pick up something new, so I have to live up to it to understand it a little bit. This time frame, time is crucial in every um, existential change. This holds true uh, for um, other situations, but uh, of course in, in therapy. And um, what we will get through briefly um, are several chapters. This is specific situations in time as momentum for development. What brings it to really um, a, a change? Uh, a second, do we reach a level of uh, in therapy that we may appropriately um, call the eternal present? I, kept, I skipped that because it's so difficult. I, I, but I, I won't skip it completely. I, um, I bring up the, uh, the, the third part of the present considered under the neurobiological aspect, and then we go to how to create the moment of kairos. This specific time where really change is able to occur, yeah? and what can we do? And then the impact of intensity and duration, we are speaking all the time of intensity in bounding psychotherapy. And very little we are speaking about duration, which is also uh, very important. Also, uh, a lot of people do it uh, conceptualized and uh, also intuitively very well. And I want to thank many of, of these people in the room, especially I want to mention two people. This is Julia and Jeff Gordon. Uh, Jeff was my mentor, as you, uh, I think many of you know, and I'm forever grateful uh, to what you did for me and uh, do up to uh, this moment. By the way, is everybody hearing it? If not, maybe you know. The microphone. Yeah. The microphone. The microphone? Is yeah. there something that can no. You have to stand up there. Or? <laughs> okay, I try to be louder. Yeah. 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 If you, you can raise your hand so I see it and get louder. Okay. So we start with the specific situations in time as momentum for development. Uh, for the normality of life, we have continuity and we have discontinuity. That seems to be trivial. And uh, what we experience as a continuity is sometimes we think it's discontinuity. Uh, like, um, I, I, I uh, had a nice sleep tonight and I was waking up. This is apparently discontinuity, but I don't live through it like this. I know that Inga was, uh, will greet me in a nice way this morning, and I anticipated and it, it's a continuity. So we have to have and experience ourselves continuity, and, and that means to feel and to experience us as stable as the same throughout time. If we don't have that, we have psychosis. Either, either experimental or endogenous or whatever. And to, to have the impact, the experience that I am me, I am I, is absolutely fundamental. But it's not a, a like a, a, the, a, the meter in Paris, the original meter somewhere in the Tresor in Paris, the I is the I. I was there yesterday and today, tomorrow. <laughs> it seems to be stable, but in fact, it's a very complicated process. But this process is so safe 
that's normally and uh, normally is not disturbed in any of us. If it is disturbed on a different, uh, a deeper level, then we have a psychosis. Um, and this is the narrative connex. We remember ourselves to be who we are in time, space, and context. And through this alignment, I hope that's the correct English word, uh, we experience ourselves as is it identical, if it's joyful, or it's sad, or something, or painful. That is not so important. The most important thing is <coughs> ourselves. And we have to have that, and people cling to it. Okay? They cling to it, even if it's very destructive for that. They cling to their own identity. Um, so, discontinuity, a uh, discontinuity, I would say, you could define it um, uh, differently as a sudden change that we experience as new. We have to have that experience that it's new, so it doesn't make sense to define it objectively. It's a subjective thing. Yeah. For something, somebody, you know, when 100 people from the bonding uh, psychotherapy society will walk through uh, Bruges and we'll, everybody would say, oh, it's nice, it's the garden, and it's very interesting, yeah, it's a beautiful city and so on. But there's one guy who sees it's such a small a statue of St. Mary on the third floor, already corrugated, but it has an iconological form that he has never seen ever. Also, he studied late Gothic, Gothic sculpture. Then this is the threat. So for him, it's new. Okay, um, and the point is that I would introduce uh, the, the term crisis here. And um, because it's very helpful to have um, a scope of crisis, this is the Chinese ideogram, as many of you know. <laughs> Alexander is, uh, is shaking his head, but already President Kennedy once was quoting it. And uh, the interesting thing is, the interesting thing is, um, this is crisis, and is as you can see, it's a double in your ground. And there you have it. It is at the same time danger and chance. So the problem what we have with crisis is that we either if we, we are uh, subject to it, or if we are trying to get along with it as therapists, we have the tendency, I feel, that we are going to one side. Either we are a little bit uh, exaggerating the danger or the chance side. And it's in this we do this because we can more easily get along with the world if we have a monocausal uh, field theory. So we get relaxed. Yeah? We think of Dr. Grossman and say, oh, that's nice, but we relax. And um, <laughs> that, in the, in the, the great thing is the, in, in treating crisis, to see and feel both sides very strongly. Um, and um, I won't go out of time, I won't go through the natural crises, you know. Uh, like puberty, falling in love, uh, so-called enlightenment, uh, uh, separation of close relatives, and so on. And uh, of course, there are uh, chronic disease, severe uh, psychological disturbances, severe addiction, and so they bring people to crisis, and that they normally uh, don't use the chance because they are not able to use the chance that is in inherent in any crisis. Um, and it doesn't matter whether this is conceived, the structure inherent in the crisis as danger and chance is conceived or uh, let alone conceptualized as such. Um, and, and it doesn't matter if, if whether it may or, or may not be felt as such. 
it is like that. And the, the crisis is, to my view, a possibility to change oneself. These are the great gifts in life. To change yourself. When I say gift, I say objectively gift. I don't go into the chance side. It's also the danger. There's a lot of danger in life, self danger. But it's also an invitation. My dear friend, you are greater than you are. And I invite you to, to change. Um, it, it's a change of one's identity, and as I said, we have to be the same, otherwise we, uh, we uh, will have a psychosis. Uh, it seems to be contradictory, and the, uh, uh, and the solution to this riddle is uh, simple, that we have, um, there are different models of um, shells over shells of identity. And I don't, uh, I will not go into these different ones. The one I like most is by Christian Schaffer, from a psychiatrist from um, from Switzerland, from Zurich. And uh, the most important point, what, uh, what I want to stress here, is uh, that we have levels of identity that we are not daring to change and we cannot change. But we have a, an outer surface of identity, which is called the self-concept what I think I am, and I please, Inger, want you to see me as such. It's not the same as persona in Sege Jung's terms, but it's a little, it's a little bit overlapping. So it's, it's the self-concept. And the invitation is to change the self-concept, and then we are very close to a new identity process. Change really the identity. And uh, it can be, have, it can happen to be changed by force. I'm forced to change against my will. And it's very threatening. The felt danger is very much also. Many other people will say, this is the best thing it could happen for you. But the, the subject may say, no, I cannot do this. It's too dangerous, much too dangerous. Uh, to be pushed. Please change yourself otherwise, you know. And when I, 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 I read this verse, pushing, or I hear this, I always think uh, of my great mentor, and I have, I'm allowed to say my friend, George Reining, because he said several times, you are my friend, so I uh, sometimes I believe it. <laughs> and uh, he said this beautiful sentence I want to quote, Again and again, um, it's uh, literal. He's, he said, it "Was when my, I first walked with him. My first walk, he said, we don't push anybody into anything. We are just here, ready to help if some emotion wants to come up, and that is so great. So, um, push is very difficult. Then you could read." the um, crisis as an invitation. You have to change yourselves. So you go to the cascade going up. You are invited to change yourself. You are allowed to change <coughs> yourself. And you really are able to take the advantage in your own hand and co-work with your destiny. If you could do this, we don't, we wouldn't need any therapy. But um, every, everybody knows the sentence, um, I'm changing myself. It's a trivial sentence. Logically, it's a very difficult sentence. If you, if you would try to put it in formal logic, it's very difficult. It's a paradox. But everybody lives with this paradox. But in this paradox, we have at least two eyes. Hmm? The one that is changing, and the one that is changed, and nobody would recognize that this is happening if there isn't at least a third eye. This is the one that is observing that the first one is trying to change or is in the intention to change, ask to change, and the second one that is changed. 
And this observer, witness, supervisor, and promoter is not the end of the wisdom because it identifies it normally immediately. So to say, in no time, with either I1 or I2. So it's not, it's not known anymore. Okay. Then I have this uh, beautiful quotation, I think, from Arthur Schopenhauer, German philosopher, who says, the Mensch kann uh, tun, was er will, aber er kann nicht wollen, was er will. Man uh, is able to uh, do what he wants, but he cannot want what he wants. And, and it's a beautiful saying because it, it says, uh, it, it gives a connotation of our free will and where we are determined. So the first part of the sentence is where we are really free. And the second is where we are not free at all. And so therapy comes uh, because I don't want that my friend uh, Jeff will say after the talk, it was a little too philosophical. So when it comes to therapy, the second part of the sentence is at stake. The, the first part of the sentence is no problem. But what do we do with somebody who is not able to want what he wants? And uh, this is a crisis because the third danger, not object objectively, that's not interesting, but the third danger, the threat to one's identity is so big that the stress piles up. Think of the beautiful data that we heard from Dr. Grossman that brings the old attitude to activation. Hmm? We see that every now and then, yeah? Inger, we could see this, and then the old attitudes get activated. <laughs> and, and this is bringing us to the point of the impossibility to want what we want. We want to get rid of this addiction. We want of, to get rid of this uh, codependent behavior, or whatever, but we cannot really want it. And so, if somebody is happy, then he comes to therapy center, or it comes to the book, or wherever, and, and says, and this is the first important step, I cannot do what I want, because I cannot want it. And please help me to bring me in the state that I can want what I want. Um, and, and there, the, the, therapy, the therapy comes in. in and um, we have, I want to go briefly through that. If we have this, uh, uh, the scope of, as I said, um, the tendency uh, to go more to the danger side, but more to the change side. This is, uh, may happen to everybody. And it may happen uh, as a problem for the client. Uh, the client may have an overwhelming fear of danger, catastrophic thinking, acting out. And, or, or, on the other hand, an overwhelming and sometimes contraphobic joy of anticipated chance, irrelevant acting out, as Virginia Satir would say, some other people would say with another model in their mind, hysterical acting out and so on. And the problem of the therapist could be to be to, to too strongly see and feel the danger. Supposedly, that's the inner working model of the therapist because I have so much empathy, you know. This people is so traumatized, you know, that I need a break for fortnight. Yeah. And this, yeah. so deep, you know. And this is, you have so much empathy. Yeah. And, uh, or so called realist. Mm -hmm. Nothing against empathy, it's absolutely I'm for empathy. But it's, there, there is also for empathy, it holds true that it can be a little bit fake. It can be combined with a form of domination. I am the big guy, uh, the white guy, and I lean down to you, you're so morphine, 
because they are so tiny and dirty. And they, this is this is planet, really, but it has it it has not the connotation of a environment. What would environment be in English? Mercy. Mercy. Hmm? Mercy. 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 Yes. And because mercy is only existing when you are on my contact. I'm not better than you. I may be in the state to help you. That's fine. But I'm not better. And, and this is uh, much more. Uh, so this is uh, a little bit about empathy. In reality, quite often, because of the therapist's own attitude, and the old fear coming up, and the old uh, seeing the universe as dangerous. Hmm? Or, on the contrary, strongly seeing and feeling the chance because of positive thinking and professional attitude role and instinct of the and so on. I have nothing against any of these. <laughs> I say only they, they may add to a problem because uh, uh, there will be an asymmetry. And um, this can. Um, This can bring up um, that is more uh, seeing the world to, to the danger side and see uh, more to the change side than uh, analog, in a lot analog way, therapist and, and uh, uh, to, to the change side or to the danger side. So possibly they are aware of it, hopefully the therapist, but may not. And uh, so there is collusion, you know, when the therapist D and the client D uh, 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 act together, uh, there's a collusion. Yeah, they are. Um, they administer the depression. Yeah, they, they, there's so much depression and there's so much empathy and so much feeling and was even even worse and so on. Yeah, and it's not happy. This, this long running therapy that uh, hardly change anybody. And from the point of view of the drama break, um, the client goes in the position of um, the victim, and the therapist goes in the position of the savior. And the drama break is turning around fast. And it does not help. Also, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, client, may be enhanced um, his uh, learned helplessness may be enhanced so we as bonding service we would rather easily notice that because we would see that somebody would stick in level two or level one yeah denial or control of the pain um, and um, uh, let's go only to the, uh, the, the therapist has a more tendency to uh, look to the universe from the point of view of danger uh, and the client of uh, a chance. Then the client um, uh, feels the therapist is um, enhancing his depression yeah, because he wants to um, go further on. Um, and he feels finally misunderstood and uh, blocked. So he eventually will, uh, will go out and the therapist feels that the cl uh, client has a hysterical defense yeah. and uh, he's not realistic and he doesn't really want to change. He's demotivated. So we end up with that nice but thin term. And I, I don't say it's easy, not at all. It's difficult. But I want to give the model 
to sometimes look at this, and this may not um, uh, may not uh, be very apparent uh, in normal life, either of the client or of the patient. But when crisis comes up, we have this double double scope. And we go, we have the tendency to go to the old vision of the universe. Okay. Uh, so, of course, uh, this is the old uh, George Reining uh, model, modified model, and I uh, have spoken with Carlo and Johan so many times, and of course it's Julia and Jeff, and uh, just want to remember you briefly that um, in a crisis, he can say there's too much danger to you. You need more protection. <laughs> but protection helps people to be a little bit more stable, or very much, but it never has helped anybody to integrate. So the problem is you have to um, help somebody to integrate what is happening and integration implicitly needs a, a coming close to the old experience but this has to happen under a protecting condition again George Reinick said this um, the protection has to be in every atom of time bigger than the possible re-traumatization by advancing to the trauma. This, of course, Ute, is a very difficult job, and I, I admire the, uh, your job, and everybody who's working with the trauma, and we did this in our clinic very, very much, and we, unfortunately, we were um, helpful to many people. So what, uh, what that means here in, in, in our emotion level a model means we have to go up from level two into a, a level three full body expression but then yes just turn out the volume a bit yeah thank you very much yeah okay um and um but there is a big problem arises because the pain the old pain may come up incredibly. So the wisdom of the therapist, not only the intuitive wisdom, but the wisdom by experience also, is to give really that protection. Mm -hmm. And I, um, in the attitude work, uh, if it comes at stake in the training, also what I did in your center, I say all the time, for a therapist, stay away if you are not sure to bring some somebody through, because it, then you would reinforce the old attitude. You have, if you go to that point, you have to bring him through. Yeah. But then it's very correcting because it is correcting because it says yes, it is so dangerous. But yes. I have lived through, and I can protect myself. I was not only protected, but I can protect myself, speaking a little bit with the uh, paraphrase of the inner child. So, um, um, then we have uh, the present uh, considered under its, uh, its neurobiological aspects. I thought, I, I will do this, yeah? I can read some textbooks. And I found this very, very and when I found it's very little, I got under stress and thought, I, I want to find that little. <laughs> and finally, I didn't find it. <laughs> then I phoned um, Professor Witter. Gerhard Hütter is one of the leading neurobiologists, I think, in Germany. And I asked him, uh, Gerhard, I have this problem. The, 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 the speech is coming up, and could you help me with this? And he says, um, hey, you could you could ask psychiatrists, <coughs> they would come with the chronobirth dialogical thing. And I thought, I thought, yes, I know this because I, it's literary research. I know this was in the in the in the, the Pons 
uh, uh, but uh, this is not the point. And she said, there, apart from this, there's very little. And I spoke with Professor Bauer, and I said, please, you can help me, yeah, with this. And he said, oh, this is really, uh, this is really something. Uh, there's very little. But he gave me some hints. So, um, what the, uh, the paper I published with uh, Jeff, this is very grounded. This is very grounded. So there is no, uh, there's too much literature, uh, you know, uh, being fundamental. What I tell you now, I'm not so secure. But it, as, as it is important, because Kairos has this little time, and identity change has this little time, uh, this little open time, which we can use or lose, and uh, I try to think about this in a, hopefully reasonable form, what, uh, in, in what is going on in our brain. So um, let's go to time in physics. Classical physics uh, has the past, present, and future, and the present is a point in time. OK. Um, in quantum mechanics, we have the uncertainty of time and space. Uh, but uh, I don't go into esoterics. Uh, uh, some therapists use quantum the theory because they think, oh yes, it, it, it's a little bit what I feel with the therapy, but it's not the case because the, the, the time frame is so tiny. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't fly. Okay, then I have time in psychology. And so we cannot live in the past because it doesn't exist anymore. That seems to be trivial. It is not, but it seems to be trivial. We cannot live in the future because it's not existing. But we may feel that we are feeling in the past or in the future. That is what we do quite often. Somebody said it's not, it's not bad that the brain is most of the time um, uh, taking care of itself. And it's only one, one little information. When we see in a new face, when we see a new face, let alone a known face, a new face, we see only 20%. The rest makes our whole brain. This is why people don't even know the, the, uh, the eye color of a co-worker uh, he works with uh, uh, three months. Some, uh, some uh, even don't know the, uh, the, the eye color of their Wives. Okay. Um, and most of the time, I said here politely, sometimes when we think we are feeling in the present, it may be absolutely an illusion. We are sticking to a past that is in our memory, or we are sticking in the future that is in our anticipating oriental lobe. And that is why in so many traditions, not only therapeutic, but philosophical and spiritual traditions, it's an old imperative. Be awake, my friend. Finally, find your way out. Or be in the here and now. That's a little bit too much said. I don't like it too much. But there is some truth in it. Or be aware. Much of the awareness uh, program is about this. Yeah. Start to be able get out of taking care of yourself, you know, the old thing all the time. With the old attitude, of course. So um, when we go to physiology, uh, the present, if the present were a point in time, it would not have any except, uh, extension. Time uh, has no extension. And if something has no extension, <coughs> you cannot experience it. So we cannot experience present. So we are to the point, logically, we cannot experience past, we cannot experience future, and we cannot experience the present. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and that means our concept of present as a point in time cannot be true 
because we could never ever experience it. And um, there is an old concept. I, I couldn't. Um, I, I couldn't. I look it up because it's my, the, one of the sad moments in my life that I have no access to a, a, a really academic library all the time. Um, and but I quote it from memory that Thomas Aquinas said, it's, it's in German, the translation, I don't know the original Latin, and the present is a new in German. It's, it's some very small time. It, it, is, it is time. And this is very close to what in Europe what biology means. There is also another, um, Pepper, Professor Pepper that brought that up, and uh, Wolf Singer from the, um, from the uh, Max Planck Institute of uh, neuro Neurophysiology. There is a two to three second interval of ultra short time memory. Uh, that is the recall that is probably combi combinated with what we feel at present. That is what you, uh, what you, uh, what, you uh, what, what you use when you are phoning the um, uh, the operator and say, "I want that number of uh, Julia Gordon," and he, he says you have a number with eight um, uh, eight numbers, and you say, "Thank you very much," and you recall that. But after 20 sec seconds, you cannot recall it anymore. An instant recall. So it's uh, it may be maybe tentatively this that this is important for and uh, uh, preserving the ego state because we are recalling what the, who we are, what we are. Okay. Um, um, now we go as time is is already very complicated and the most uh, intelligent people tried to find it out and could not with sad echoes famous and so on. So we get into the more complicated part that is consciousness. Consciousness is not defined by the international system because they gave up to define it. They said we don't define consciousness anymore. I'm the defined system says it explicitly we will never define it, but we don't need to. We define disturbances of consciousness, and then we can, that we can do. And we can do this very well quantitatively, that is neurology. Qualitatively, that is much more difficult. Um, and I, I made up my mind, and I give you this only for as to think about this, not a truth, a, a solid truth. Uh, I think there are several steps or cas a cascade in self-awareness. Uh, we are most of the time, we are not being present psychologically as I. We are acting automatically and this is very nice. Otherwise we wouldn't have any routines and we couldn't, couldn't uh, run or we couldn't uh, uh, ski or whatever. Yeah, and, and not even pack so well, maybe. And uh, then a second step, a little bit more to self-consciousness, is being present without self-conscious. Somehow I feel present in this moment, but that doesn't mean that I'm inherently really convinced, oh, it's me. Third, knowing oneself implicitly, and the second, the fourth would be to know to know oneself. And this, to my view, uh, happens very, really, uh, 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 very um, rarely in time. Really, to go to that point where you all inspired realize, oh, it's me. And we had two beautiful interviews before midnight last night with uh, Alejandro and, and, and Sylvia, and they both, from their own, brought up that point in their experience, but through the bondage, when they all of a sudden were astonished, that's me. And I get to that identity. And it's really changing the identity. And um, this is the point, coming back, this is the point of Kairos. Kairos is that time 
their real change can happen. Real change means changing in the outer structure of the ego, the self-concept. What I think I am. What I feel I am. But I am greater than I am. That's the old imperative from Baroque poet uh, Angelus Silesius, the uh, other of this. He can't that you are, which is absolutely paradoxical. If I am that, I cannot become it. <coughs> I have to, if, if, if necessary, I have to become, I'm not there. So it's, it's absolutely paradoxical, <coughs> but everybody understands it, because everybody knows I want to stay there, <coughs> and everybody knows at the same time, I'm not that person. I'm apt to, I am greater <coughs> and I can live to, help, um, to uh, become greater. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um. So how to uh, come to that point? To know, to know oneself. <coughs> there are many disciplines trying to do this meditation um, and uh, training of awareness yeah first to be aware of other things then uh, something that seems to be myself like my thoughts which apparently are conceptualized to be distant from something more in a hinduistic um, thinking of atman is brahman and so on and um, and the question is, who is the one that believes and affirms, affirms I am I, I am you? Who is the one? Then we have the fourth I. Seeing even the observer, observing the one that is changing and the one that may be changing. And then you are stepping out of the system. Even for, if it's only for a short break in time, we are stepping out and really are able uh, to see, oh, it may happen. That it may not happen because we don't know how. But uh, this is one of the great moments in therapy, and I think in, in all of our lives, to help people to bring them to that moment. It needs a lot of time. It needs a lot of protection to bring them eventually to that moment. And then really to have the truth. And it <coughs> would not take place, to my view, if the um, therapist would not have worked through his own deep fears. The universe is dangerous. And this deep and Controlled joy, you know, it's only chance. You know, we discard the garbage. You know, we stay on. He has to. He has to go through. Talk about time. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, this is the. I go very briefly through this. Uh, this is. Um, this is very apparently. Uh, the three um, three uh, regions in uh, in the, the brain where it may take place on a neurological basis on a neurobiological basis this awareness and um, I'm not sure about this but it has to be anywhere and anyhow it does not happen without a a strong Feeling. And uh, the change also doesn't happen uh, with a, a very, without a very intensive feeling. Why? Because you need what Gerhard Hütter would uh, call the enthusiasm, also on the neurobiological side, the oxytocin and the, uh, the, uh, the dopamine being raised, raised up and in, in the brain to bring you through that in enthusiasm into the next step. So, um, um, and then time, 
when Tanya comes in, we're using this uh, published model by uh, Jeff and me. Um, when you have the uh, the lower um, freezing circle, you know, from sensor autonomous immediately to amygdala, uh, there's no eye going in, you know, just freezing, you know, just adding. You know. And then when you go to the second loading the system up, you go to the second um, uh, pathway uh, through the via sen uh, sensory cortex, even there is not the I involved in the sense that I'm perceiving that's me. And that's why on a, on, a, on a neurobiological model, it's reasonable uh, to think, to, to pile the energy up, hmm, to go to that proven, statistic, it's absolutely proven, to that third level, what we do in bonding, because we block here um, the, the attack, the flight, the attack, the freezing or the dissociation, we block it here. And we bring up that emotional response into the emotional stimulus, getting higher and higher towards the intensity of emotion going through that, through that, and then coming up with that. And there, the old memories and the old attitude gets um, conscious. And uh, it, the system opens up for a semantic, syntactic, and context new uh, information. So the freedom, coming back to the Schopenhauer phrase, to want what you don't want, you cannot want. This freedom appears. And this is neurobiological, to my view, it's uh, the Kairos. So, um, before uh, <laughs> Martin is uh, apparently really um, uh, canceling this, I want to um, uh, go to one thing because I don't want you to say, oh no, you didn't say about anything about the eternal present. Um, briefly, this is from a, a, one of the source books on Zen Buddhism. It's, many of you know this. This is The Oxen and His Shepherd. And some are nodding. I'm happy to hear this. This is uh, 10 drawings. And they were so reworked that nobody wanted, said anything about this. Yeah. Only after 200 years, somebody wrote some poem. And after another 300 years, somebody wrote an abbot, you know, very likely, wrote a commentary. And it starts, I'm quoting it from the German, um, Noch niemals ist der Ochse vermisst worden. The oxen was never missed, ever. That means there is no problem at all. There are only illusionary problems. End of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> the oxen was never missed. The oxen stands for the inner heart. But then the second <coughs> line goes on. Um, but it happened that the shepherd went away from himself. So he lost the oxen mm -hmm. till he vanished in the vastness, absolutely vanished. And that is our human condition. In reality, there's nothing to do. But the whole of humanity is saying, you are not yourself. And stand up, wake up, to come to yourself. And I won't go through all these uh, uh, things, but uh, this is three. Three is 10. It's 10 uh, images, 10 is not Satori. I learned this from a Zen Buddhist. A three is Satori. With Satori, this is not an The Western conception. We are enlightened, I think so. No, three is Satori. He, he sees the ox. Incredible. But then he has to learn to find him, to tame him. And um, so this, and then 
is where he, from the fourth level of identity, the outer shell, I form, is sovereign autonomously riding on his own oxen, playing the flute, playing the inner child. And the oxen is, is liking it so much, it's so beautifully drawn to my view, that he holds up his, his head to listen to the beautiful um, uh, flute. And it, 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 that we have to, um, we have to use these discontinuity moments, chaos. But then we have to work on it again and again because uh, we can lose it. Johan in the power group many times was talking about <laughs> how we lose. Where we all are already, we can lose enlightenment, we can lose new attitude, where we can lose our tendency. And not to be addicted and, and so on. So um, we thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> it's a challenge as a dresser, and uh, I want to. Uh,